All right, so go ahead and navigate on your device or on, in your Bible to Isaiah 29 so that you can follow along. The topic we'll discuss there this morning, the Lord diagnoses Israel with spiritual blindness and discusses how she got that way. The title of the message, Random Facts on Blindness. Let's pray. Father, today as we uh, have come to worship you, uh, what a joy, what a blessing, Lord. You've given us a place and uh, other people to be with, Lord, to share that divine experience. And Lord, you gave us your word. Uh, and it's really the primary way that you speak to us, Lord, that you deal with us. And so we want to get it right. We want to understand what this word means to Isaiah and to the Jews of his time and uh, also uh, to those future Jews that he talks about, but also in our own lives, Lord. We don't want to overstep and claim anything that's not ours, but we don't want to miss anything that's ours either. And so I pray that by your spirit, you would minister to each heart here today. We pray in Jesus' name, and those who agreed said, amen. I am also quite blind. If you're a fan, you might recognize that slightly obscure quote. It's from season one, episode 29, titled, Operation Annihilation. Alien entities attach themselves to humans with cheesy 1960s special effects. In an effort to separate them without killing the humans, they expose them to the full spectrum of blinding visible light. It works, but in the process, Mr. Spock announces, I am free of it and the pain, and I am also quite blind. As if he doesn't feel bad enough, Dr. McCoy then discovers he didn't need to expose Spock to the entire visible light spectrum, just to ultraviolet light. Spock need not have been blinded. Not to worry, he recovers, revealing to all that Vulcans have a protective inner eyelid for just such an emergency. <laughs> the Jews Isaiah was speaking of, uh, too rather, did not have such an eyelid. In verse 9 we read, blind yourselves and be blind. The nation of Israel blinded itself. A spiritually blind nation, not to worry, in verse 18, we're going to read, In that day, the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, Israel's blindness can serve as a warning to you. And number two, Israel's blindness can serve as a witness to you. Let's take a look at the warning in verses 1 through 13. You can be born blind. You can go blind on account of various injuries or illnesses. Rarely do you hear about a person who purposely blinds themselves. Israel did, without knowing it, and it prompts us to ask how before we get too far into our study. Now look at verse 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Their blindness stemmed from a disconnect between what their mouths and lips were doing and what was truly in their hearts. Okay, so you would say it is spiritual heart trouble. Well, there's an awful lot that can affect your heart. What was it for Israel? Well, it would seem that they had removed their hearts far from God. So you've heard of heart transplants? This is a heart removal. They decided they didn't need a heart for God. It was accomplished by preferring the commandments of men. He was referring to the addition of man-made rules, rights, and regulations, and traditions, which were extra-biblical. Now, that in itself isn't always wrong. A lot of churches, ours included, have certain traditions and all, but what he's talking about here is when you believe that keeping the commandments of men and their traditions and what they've put down is more authoritative than the word of God. He goes, that leads to the situation where you do not need a heart for God anymore because you are following the commandments of men and doing everything for external purposes. And then once you don't have a heart for God, then you still, they still worship God, but not really. Their mouth and their lips uh, are, are motivated by things that are not genuine. In the New Testament, Jesus healed a man from a lifetime of blindness. He did it on Sabbath. It violated man-made commandments, added extra-biblical traditions of men that healing was work. 
that could not be performed on the Sabbath. In some meeting, at some point in history, a bunch of rabbis got together and said, oh, what about healing? Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? And they bantered back and forth. They finally decided, no. You, I think it, they, what they came down to was, it's okay if somebody's going to die, you're bleeding to death. They can stop the bleeding and preserve you until they can work on you after the Sabbath. But to just go up to somebody who, and heal them, well, that's a work, and that's to be condemned. So this is the kind of thing, it's an extreme example of it that we're talking about. But when you start to believe the commandments of men and put them over the authority of the word of God, that's how you start to act, like the New Testament Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, uh, where you don't need a heart for God anymore. And so elevating the commandments of men over the word of God began a process that eventuated in Israel's spiritual blindness. And so verse 1, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt, add year to year, let feasts come around. There are only two places where Ariel appears in the Old Testament. In Ezra, it is a mermaid with red hair. No, I'm sorry. In Ezra, it is a proper man's name. Wow. That's stunning. And in our text, we see it no less than five times as a name for Israel. Now, as with a lot of things, there are multitudes of different uh, definitions or meanings. A lot of scholars will say, well, Ariel means this or Ariel means that. All I can tell is that it is a name that God gave to Israel, and it seems to be an endearing name. It's, it's like a precious name. It's like, you know, maybe a husband and wife or you and your children would have certain names for each other. And so he's calling Israel here Ariel. And it harkens back to the glory days of David. That's one of the reasons I think it's that, because he brings up David, who was the man after his own heart. And that time, you know, short though it may have been, when everything was firing on all cylinders for Israel. And what he's saying here in verse 1 is that in all of their distresses that he brings upon them, the nation will always be his beloved Ariel. Year to year in feasts is a description of what the Lord intended for his nation to be ruled over by the man after God's own heart, the worshiping, dancing king, while celebrating feast after feast after feast, year after year after year. The Lord had such high hopes for them and, and such wonderful plans for them. Notwithstanding persecution and trials and the devil harassing you and the general difficulties of life in a fallen world, Jesus wants you to enjoy him year after year after year until you go to be home with him. Remember, no matter your life's path, you can always say, it is well with my soul. And that's the, the important thing. We are physical beings. We will continue to be physical beings in the future. We don't have supernatural bodies or vapor-like bodies. You saw Jesus rose from the dead in a body, a physical body. It's a glorified body, uh, but it, it is necessarily physical. And so uh, at the same time, though, it is what's well with our soul. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. We're on our way to a resurrection or a rapture. And, and so, yeah, the world's a, a terrible place. It's an awful place. It's never going to be getting better and better, but always worse and worse. And we should have a genuine longing to be out of it, uh, not just to escape, you know, something, but to be with the Lord. Uh, but uh, it can always be well with my soul. And I think I told you last week, just for fun, when people ask you, how how you doing? Just say, well, it is well with my soul. Uh, I, don't, I can't even begin to tell you what physically is going on or emotionally or in my marriage or at my work or whatever, but I can tell you one thing. It's well with my soul, and the Lord's working it out. Verse 2, yet I will distress Ariel. There shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. With genuine reluctance, the Lord must distress the nation. Too much was at stake. Judah's backsliding. He must bring them back to their love for him. Because it was through Israel that the whole earth was going to be blessed with the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. They were bringing the Messiah through their line. The Lord stepped in, as he always does, to ensure there would be a remnant of godly Jews. I love the fact that he says it, 
the nation shall be to me as Ariel. His Ariel, no matter their faithlessness, he loves them with an everlasting love. And so he must discipline them. He must distress them. They're far away from him. They've taken, a, as if they have removed their hearts and are pursuing other things that are uh, deceitful. God loves you that much. God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. Israel is a special nation, a special chosen people to God. But he gave his son for the whole world, not just Israel. He's the savior of all men, especially those who believe. He'll draw you to himself by the cross, the Holy Spirit, opening your heart to be able to exercise free will and receive the Lord. Verse 3, I will encamp against you all around. I will lay siege against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you. The Assyrian invaders would be the Lord's instrument of distress by siege warfare and weapons designed for such. They would conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. They would almost conquer the southern kingdom of Judah. And not long after, the Babylonian invaders would besiege Jerusalem three times, ruining the city and its temple in that final siege. Verse 4, you should be brought down. You shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low out of the dust. Your voice shall be like that of a medium's out of the ground. And your speech shall whisper out of the dust. Wow, why didn't you be an actor, Pastor Gene? Anyway, I think I've proven why. Uh, medium is a broad title that describes anyone who dabbles in the occult, a witch, a sorcerer, psychic. My personal favorite is necromancer. The, who is it? It's the necromancer. Get out. Uh, it says here their speech comes out of the ground. Now, there's an example of this in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, King Saul who is terribly disobedient uh, and just has, you know, blown it so many times. Philistines are moving upon Israel, and he seeks the Lord for advice, and the Lord just doesn't talk to him. He doesn't give him any advice. And so Saul says, well, if the Lord's not going to talk to me, I'm going to go talk to a witch. And so he goes and talks to the witch, and uh, they're all surprised that Samuel comes out the, of the, up out of the ground, it says. And he talks to him from beyond the grave. And he says, man, you really shouldn't dabble in the occult. Uh, and as a result, you're going to die. Uh, and he predicts what happens in that battle. And so that's the kind of thing. And so we get from this that uh, we're not told directly, but we are told indirectly, the Jews of Isaiah's time were dabbling with the occult and you know, looking for these things to come up out of the ground, as it were. Isaiah had warned against these practices. You know, Satan comes to church, and he does it on a regular basis. His attendance might be better than yours and mine. I think he's at church every Sunday, right? Uh, not him personally, but he, you know, he's got people assigned, and uh, well, not people, but demons and, and spiritual individuals, uh, and they're assigned, and they come to church, and eventually they try and, and introduce somehow the occult or the esoteric. You know, whether it's, and it's usually, I shouldn't say usually, but a lot of times it has to do with your prayer life. Because everybody takes a hit there. I don't know anybody I've ever said to, do you pray enough? And they say, absolutely. I pray without ceasing. I pray more than the Apostle Paul. In fact, I'm praying right now as I talk to you. I mean, you know, nobody, it's everybody's like, oh, yeah. I meant to pray, and you know, then all of a sudden, you know, I, I smelled the bishkati that was cooking, and I had to, you know, or the, my coffee was done, or whatever, and stuff. And so they hit you, and they say, well, here's, you know, here's how the early church prayed. They stuffed insects up their nose, and they hopped around a prayer labyrinth, and they, you know, and, and, and you think, wow, this seems really spiritual. And you're moved, and, and, you know, it's like, it's not just like praying in your closet at home. You know, it's like, well, I'm in a, I'm in a labyrinth where the Lord is meeting. And, and, you know, all these customs come in. It's not just prayer, but, but it happens, and, and Christians get all stumbled by it. And uh, Satan's excited about it. He gives them all Christianized names. Verse 5, moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away. Yes, it shall be in an instant, suddenly. The Assyrian siege of Judah matches this prediction. Overnight, the angel of the Lord, which is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, 
he kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And that effectively ends the battle because all the soldiers are dead. Verse 6, you will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. The multitude of all nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall be even as when a hungry man dreams and look, he eats, but he awakes and his soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams and look, he drinks, but he awakes and indeed he is faint and his soul still craves. So the multitude of all the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion. This whole section seems like it's more than just the Assyrians, right? It talks about all the nations, earthquakes and all this stuff. It is a leap forward to the great tribulation, that seven year time of Jacob's trouble. And and again, the prophets did this all the time, sometimes in the middle of a verse, going from past to near future to far future. And it's not hard to identify if you read it, you say, hey, wait a minute, there's a, this is something bigger than just the Assyrian invasion. This is something described in the book of the Revelation. And so verse nine, pause and wonder, blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, covered your heads, namely the seers. Their confusion wasn't from alcohol, but it says here the Lord poured out on them a potent potable that dulled their spiritual senses. Did they blind themselves or does God blind them? This is always the the thing that people want to talk about and argue about. Both are true. Since they were acting in a manner that could only lead to spiritual blindness and they would not repent from it, God let it happen and then enforced it. And so we've seen that they were, they were listening to the commands of men, following the commands of men, forgetting the, the word of God, uh, and that led to the removal of their heart because they didn't need it anymore, and to lips and mouth praising the Lord in a phony, hypocritical way. God gives them all kinds of time to repent. He sends them genuine prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, and they ignore those guys, sometimes uh, persecuting, well, all the time persecuting them or killing them. And so at some point, God says, if you want to be blind, I will help you. I will withdraw my support or I'll do something positive to to make you blind and you can live in your blindness. This is a Romans chapter one situation. We've talked about it a lot where God says there is a downward progression. If you don't want to keep God in your heart, then I'll just back off and let you have your own way. And it's not pretty because of what men do to each other. And I think you know, not just me, but a lot of people think that's the place we're at in our society today in the United States. God has taken a step back, and he says, I'm going to let you do what you want to do. These are the leaders you deserve. This is the morals you deserve. This is what you deserve if you want to live this way. You can still be one nation under God, or you can be one nation under man. Uh, and so that's what's going on here in Israel. It says, hey, uh, you, you want to be blind? I will cooperate with you. Be blind. Verse 11, the whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is illiterate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I can't, for it's sealed. Then a book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I am not literate. So imagine you go to your doctor. He orders an MRI of your brain because something's wrong. He receives the results in a sealed envelope but doesn't open them. Instead, he hands them to you and says, Here, make your own diagnosis. And you say, well, I'm illiterate when it comes to medical things. I don't know how to read an MRI. I remember when I was at UC Riverside, I took some crazy class in uh, comparative psychology where we had to dissect a sheep brain. And I thought they had just given me cauliflower. Because that essentially it looks like a head of cauliflower. And you say, you have to, okay, where's this? And where's that? I'm not even going to, you know. I can't even remember the terms, but you had to identify all the little things by putting a pin in them. I said, I'm just, I'm going to have to drop this class. <laughs> I just, it looks like it's all the same as far as I'm concerned. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't know anything about this. And so that's what's going on here. God says, you know, I, I, even if I give you my word now, you're not going to understand it because you've allowed yourself to be blind and deaf. 
Verse 13, therefore the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Worship has become about works for them and not about walking with God. Works always, always, always appeal to our pride. And so, the, you know, Israel got into this commandments of men, gave up a heart for the Lord. Next thing you know, she was messing around with the other gods of the pagan neighbors. If you have no heart for God, you begin to entertain other gods. And so this is perhaps a point of contact for us. I mean, we're not going to go full blindness. I mean, we're not parallel to Israel and all that. But it's true. There's always problems in the Christian life and in the Christian church when we begin to walk in the flesh rather than the spirit. We begin to listen to men or ourselves rather than the word of God. Paul dealt with this in the book of Galatians to the Galatian churches. He says, having begun in the spirit, you're not going to be made perfect by walking in the flesh, by your own effort, by self-righteousness. And in a sense, uh, you see the same thing in, the, in Ephesus with the church there that Jesus wrote to. He says, hey, you guys, look at all the works you guys are doing. You couldn't do any more works than you guys are doing. You're workaholics when it comes to God, but you have no love for me. You've left your first love, and you better get it back because that's more important than all of these works. Uh, and so really interesting progression here. Uh, you know, you think, well, you know, it's, it's one thing to follow, you know, this and not that. No, the Lord says, no, you don't have a heart. It says, the illustration he's given you is when you follow men and not me, you don't have a heart anymore for me to, to touch and to love. And, and you're going to go far, far astray. Works do not require love for Jesus or love for others. Anybody can do them. And, and that's, again, what we learn in Ephesus. The Lord says, you've got tons of works, no love. And so works do not need uh, love for Jesus. You don't need a heart in order to carry out religious acts. I actually can hear the Lord in verse 13 addressing the church of the Laodiceans in the book of the Revelation. He said there, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, the church of the Laodiceans was mostly unsaved individuals. Their repentance would procure the things that would cure spiritual blindness and these other things. And, of course, when Jesus says, hey, you need to buy all eye salve, and then, when, there is no such thing that can cure spiritual blindness. There isn't a, you know, you don't go to CVS and say, I'd like some eye salve. Oh, really, what's your problem? Spiritual blindness. It, it, so it's a, it, it's a thing where the Lord's saying, hey, you need something that you can't get. It, it, there's no wealth in the world, no material thing. You need me. You need to get saved. And you think, well, how can you say that most of the church was unsaved? There are mostly, lots of churches like that today. Some of you came out of churches that were mostly unsaved, and you were unsaved. And one day you got saved, and you thought, my church is mostly unsaved. What am I doing? I mean, I've, people, I've heard this testimony over and over and over again, all, you know, year after year. Uh, people say, I got saved and realized I wasn't, and nobody else was. We were just going through the motions. We had no heart for God, that kind of thing. And so um, this become, there, there were a few believers, obviously, in Laodicea, who were not blind, but the blindness of those around them could certainly influence them, influence their hearts in the wrong direction. And so it's a warning to all, and warnings are good. Israel's blindness can serve as a witness to you, verse 14. We like a good mystery. The Apostle Paul was into mysteries. He's the Bible's mystery writer, as a matter of fact. He was tasked by God to reveal seven mysteries. 1 Timothy 3, the mystery of the Incarnation. Ephesians 3, the mystery of the church. Colossians 1, the mystery of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, the mystery of the headship of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, the mystery of the translation of the church. And 2 Thessalonians 2, the mystery of lawlessness. These mysteries are things unknown to the human race until they were revealed 
to us by Paul. A mystery is a thing revealed in the New Testament. And so he says, hey, it's, it's been given to me to reveal these things for the first time. The seventh mystery is pertinent to our text in Isaiah. In the book of Romans, we read, I don't desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then all Israel will be saved. Blinded, the nation of Israel did not see and does not see their Messiah was and is Jesus Christ. They will when he returns in his second coming. Meanwhile, God's program is the gospel going out to the whole earth. And one day, the fullness of the Gentiles, the last non-Jew who's going to be saved, will be saved, and God will rapture and resurrect the church, and then he will begin to deal with his nation of Israel directly again. Where am I? Verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among his people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hidden. They were substituting the commandments of men, here called the understanding of prudent men. The Lord says he's going to cause all that to perish and do a marvelous work and a wonder. He means that the Jews will look upon the returning Lord, they'll realize he is their God and King, and all Israel will be saved by the end of the tribulation, and they will no longer follow the commandments of men that are hollow and empty and all, but they will have a heart for the Lord. In fact, the Old Testament says he will give them a heart of flesh. Verse 15, woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? This reminds me of the many warnings of false Christs and false teachers in the end times. We should be skeptical and check these things out. This isn't so much, you know, the secret sins that every Christian has that God knows about. That, that's true, and, but that's a, a topic for another time. He's saying here there are those who claim to have deep knowledge, secret knowledge that, you know, they're willing to impart to you. And so beware in the last days uh, of deceiving spirits, of seducing spirits and all of this. I think there's a big push on right now. I'll just say this and get, you know, on. There's a big push on right now for Mormonism to be uh, considered mainstream Christianity. And uh, it's really, if we are here long enough, uh, you know, uh, not raptured and resurrected and all, you're going to see that happen. Uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of different ways in the world that's, uh, you know, going on that way, but that's going to happen. And so these are the kinds of things that we're looking at in the end times. Deception, uh, seducing spirits, uh, the occult. Uh, all of that kind of thing, and um, it's, you know, who sees us kind of a thing. Verse 16, surely if things turned around, shall the potter be esteemed by the clay? Shall the thing made say of him who made it, he didn't make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Now, the potter working with clay, that's a favored illustration of God to show his relationship to Israel. The potter makes something that is both beautiful and useful. It has beauty and it has purpose. Clay is inanimate. It ought to yield to the potter's touch on the wheel. However, in the case of Israel and other nations as well, the clay hardens itself and talks back. Can you imagine? And some of you have worked with pottery before, you know, and you're like doing the wheel and, you know, more, more speed, less speed. Uh, you lop stuff off, more pressure, less pressure. And uh, maybe you're making, uh, you know, I don't know what you're making. But you're making something. It's in your mind and you're making it. And all of a sudden the clay goes, hey! Hey, I feel that. Who just, what? You ain't making me an ashtray, buddy. <laughs> well, I need an ashtray. Yeah, well, watch this, you know. And, uh, it, I mean, clay doesn't really do that unless it's you and I. Uh, but, the, you know, many times the, the Lord, you know, gives us that illustration. Like, you guys are like clay that is, uh, you know, hardened and back-talking and stuff. And so uh, the Lord says, hey, you know, I, I need you to not resist me. And that's going to happen with Israel in the end times. They will quit resisting the Lord. Verse 17. Is it not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? Historians say that Lebanon was where the invading armies would encamp uh, that would then come against Israel and Judah. 
In the future, he says, this is going to be a fruitful field with such abundance and growth, you'd think it was a forest. And so maybe it's just a tomato field, right? Uh, but it's a 10-foot high tomato field. I mean, and you look and you think, man, there's a forest over there. When you get close, it's just an abundant, you know, produce and all of that kind of thing. And again, now we're looking ahead to the millennial kingdom, to the thousand-year kingdom, when many wonderful physical changes will occur on the earth. If you've never heard some of these terms, the Great Tribulation, or, well, it's got a lot of names. We like the time of Jacob's trouble, but for purposes today, it's the Great Tribulation. That is a future seven-year period during which the Lord pours out judgments upon the inhabitants of the earth in an effort to save them, to preach the gospel to them, but he is especially working with the nation of Israel to bring them to salvation. The Jews who survive that time of Jacob's trouble will be saved, as will a multitude of Gentiles. The second coming is the return of Jesus from heaven, which ends the great tribulation. He comes to the earth and he establishes the millennium or the millennial kingdom, not the millennium falcon. Uh, it's a 1,000 year reign over the earth by Jesus after his return. So that's what's going to happen in chronological order. Verse 18, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, when the nation moves away from its stranglehold of traditions, rejects the commandments taught by men, and turns fully to God, then her spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness will be removed. Verse 19, the humble shall uh, also increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. This is more future kingdom talk. Jesus said those who would rejoice in that future kingdom were the poor in spirit, mourners, the meek, the merciful, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's at the heart of his uh, you know, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 20, for the terrible one is brought to nothing, the scornful one is consumed, all who watch for iniquity are cut off, who make a man an offender by a word, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate and turns aside the just by empty words. Now, this is how a, a peek at the morality and the justice and the righteousness and the ethics of the millennial kingdom. Uh, God will not allow corruption. Uh, he will not allow scorn, uh, reproof, those kinds of things. He will deal with them. They'll, they'll still exist because there will be human beings in the millennium. Everybody who goes into the thousand years after Jesus returns is saved, but then they have children and their children are not saved. And like any other not saved people, they're weird and they do weird things. But in that day and age, it'll be dealt with swiftly, justly, in righteousness. And that's what is being said here. Verse 22, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed nor shall his face uh, not grow pale. This takes us back to the beginnings of God's chosen nation. The Lord chose Abraham. His name was Abram at the time. He made a covenant with him that is unconditional. He promised to do things for Abraham. Abraham had to do nothing and can't add to it. He can't help it along. He just is the recipient. What he was promised generally was prom uh, land, multitudes of descendants, and that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him and them. Jacob here is signaled out, uh, be, singled out rather because it was through him that the 12 uh, tribes of Israel would descend. Finally, after centuries, Israel will be in a spiritual condition to receive their promises by recognizing the Messiah. I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, I've said, I said and I've said before, what you see happening in the Bible and in the world it takes just as much time as God has given it. No more, no less. Uh, well, I guess it could take a little bit more if we resist the Lord, right, uh, in our personal lives. But the idea is that God has a plan and he's working out that plan uh, and it involves the Abrahamic covenant and his promises to Israel. Verse 23, but when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. God's intent for his beloved Ariel has always been that they reveal him to the Gentile nations. 
In the millennium, they will finally and fully hallow God's name and be a witness to the unsaved. The A-team used to say, I love it when a plan comes together. This verse speaks of God's plan of redemption of the human race and the restoration of creation coming together in the millennial kingdom. And verse 24, these also who erred in spirit will come to understanding and those who complained will learn doctrine. Quoting Dr. Fruchtenbaum again, he says verse 24 reveals the end product of Israel's national regeneration. Israel will understand the word of God, now partially blinded in their ability to understand the scriptures in the future, they will fully understand. Israel's blindness is a witness that we are in the fullness of the Gentiles. Jesus mentioned a time in which Jerusalem would be under the dominion of Gentile authority. Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Jerusalem in around 586 to 588 BC began that period, and it's continued through the present time, uh, and the gospel is spreading until that time is over. And as I said earlier, God begins to deal directly with Israel again. Speaking of the Gentiles and blindness, uh, by the way, a Gentile is anybody who is not a Jew. I didn't know that for years as a young Christian. I thought, the Gentiles? Was this a lost race of giants or, you know? And, uh, and you know, of course, growing up, I thought there were the Italians and everybody else, you know? So um, uh, it would be, a, you should spend some time with me uh, over coffee. And it would astonish you, astonish you at how ignorant I really am. Uh, but uh, it's, I'm not saying that to be falsely humble either. I'm saying it to be ignorant. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was talking about. Something about the Gentiles. Yeah, Gentiles. So anyway, Gentiles are all non-Jews, and uh, they're going to get saved, uh, and we're Gentiles now, and the Gentiles and blind. Okay, I'm back. The Apostle Paul, so at least, you know, Biden never really comes back. He just, so... <laughs> I got out there, but I came back, okay? So when I can't come back anymore, then it's on. The God of this age, who is who? Satan. Satan. Uh, I give you these chances to respond, and you just don't do it. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. And so, you know, he has a lot of strategies for doing it, but the devil is about blinding eyes, keeping uh, your eyes blinded if you're not a believer, so that you can't see God. And the gospel, when we share the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation, which we would say in this case to open blinded eyes. And so that's the warfare. I'm a Gentile unbeliever. My eyes are blind. I cannot see spiritual things. I cannot hear spiritual things until the gospel is preached. And then there is a power unto salvation. And my heart is open to receive Jesus Christ. So what is job one for the Christian? The gospel. Preaching the gospel. And by preaching, I mean just sharing with people how to believe, what to believe, who to believe. Uh, there's other things we're called to do. Praise the Lord. Make sure you're called to do them. Don't do them in the energy of your flesh for your own purposes. But there's things other. But job one is to share the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? Paul defines it in 1 Corinthians 15. But essentially, it's that Jesus became man, died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, that you might be saved. You're a sinner. You and I are born sinners. There's nothing we can do about it. We, we cannot save ourselves. No other man can save us. No philosophy can save us B because we're sinners at the root. We have a sin nature. The only way that we could be saved was if God, who is perfectly holy, becomes us and lives a perfectly holy life in our place and then takes our place in death on the cross. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He says, I am God, but I'll become man. I'll still be God. I'm the God man. I never quit being God, and I'll never quit being man. I'll make that sacrifice, but I'm going to die on the cross. And while I'm on the cross, I'm going to say to you, I have a robe of righteousness because of the life I've lived and the nature I have. I can give that to you, and I will take your filth of sin, your filthy garments on myself. We'll make that exchange, 
And because of that, when my father, when our father looks at you, he will see me. He will see you in me. And that judgment will pass. And then after that happens, and the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, God inside of you, will start changing you. We'll give you power over the flesh, power over the devil, power over sin. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. Your addictions will be gone and your affections will be mine and, and you'll begin to grow. It'll be two steps forward and one step back a lot of times because you still have a propensity to sin, but you will grow and you will grow because I will complete the work I began in you. I will present you faultless, uh, faultless rather, before my Father in heaven. And one day you'll be in a new body. Whether you die and are resurrected or whether I'm, I rapture you, you will have a brand new glorified body that cannot sin. Well, how's that possible, Lord? How, how can a, a free will being not sin? God has free will and he cannot sin. And one day there will be a race of people, you and I, who will be in heaven with the Lord, in our glorified bodies, with free will, and unable to sin for eternity upon eternity. Are you saved? If not, today is the day of salvation.